Witchers, welcome back to the Witcher Lorecast. This is the show where we cover everything having to do with the Witchers, from the Netflix series to the video games and the books. This is your host, Tom, or Robots, and I am here as usual with my good buddy, So Thana Toasted. Welcome, oh, wow. to the welcome to the show, So Thana Toasted. The OG name, okay, okay, <laughs> damn. How you doing, how you doing, Toasty? It's a throwback. I it was So Thana Toasted for like a grand total of like... 25 seconds yes it was a long long time a long very, long time ago very long time ago how you, know you doing i realized something because mm -hmm. you, you know you're you're idling on the google doc and you're popping up as anonymous axolotl and i'm very actually very excited yes about that because i love axolotls so um yeah that's my um that's my japanese uh adventure game name i mean it, so it sounds enough. like something out of like metal gear solid or something isn't it? Isn't there an axolotl in metal? That that sounds like totally like a thing. Anyway, I don't know. I, it's an animal. <laughs> yeah, it is an animal, but it also sounds like one of those like code names from somebody's going to write in and be like, no, yeah, that's totally a character in Metal Gear. Anyway, welcome back to the show, friends. We are doing the next episode in our series, re recounting, analyzing, tearing apart, putting back together the the episodes of uh, season two of The Witcher on Netflix. And last week we covered episode two. This week we're covering episode three, and Toasty. I know it's been it's been a week since last week. I'm sure you're ready for this episode. It's been a whole week. It's been since a whole last week. week. Holy! Last time we had episodes that are very close together. This time we've had an entire week. Do you feel ready to cover this? I don't. I don't know, Tom. The ADHD is hitting real hard today, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Well. Well. I mean, this episode jumps a few different places. I mean, we got oh, yeah. stuff with Yen, we've got stuff with the elves, we've got stuff with Geralt and Siri. So why don't we just kick it off? Let's start with, what do you think, Yennefer? Yes, because I put this in a weird order. So we're going to start with Yennefer. All right. <laughs> so we're, we're going with Toasty's order here, starting with Yennefer. So um, and, and just like last week, we're going to recount the episode. We're going to try and get through the synopsis in the first half and in the second half we're going to dig a little bit more into the the specific details the things that really are worth pointing out going over a little in a little bit more depth and some of the things that we really liked or really kind of disagreed with and you know might have taken a, a little bit of oh umbrage with that's a good word let's use umbrage let's Ooh, use impressive. let's use our our advanced high school vocabulary on this episode all right here we go so where do we start uh so we start um with uh Tessaia. she's at artuza she's writing up the name of the 14 mages who died at the battle of sodden mm -hmm. um you know she has a little bit of a hesitation on Unifer's name because you know she cares about Unifer greatly um so she finishes up that we get to a council meeting uh where they're kind of questioning istrid about uh his his time in nilfgaard studying you know ancient ruins and stuff uh, and monoliths and, you know, asking if he had any indication that Nilfgaard was going to go ahead and start any of this, you know, stuff. And he tells them, no, there was nothing to signal that. And, you know, they're like, okay, well then we couldn't have known. They said that they could have known because they were literally told about it <laughs> right. by other members of the council. Right. Yeah. And he was like, no, I've ha I had basically had my head in the sand the whole time. I, I wouldn't have known. Yeah. Which... And Easter is kind of like, Try. I, I don't think this is exactly the proper moment for him to try and push his agenda on studying the history of the continent. Right. <laughs> like history is important, obviously, but like you know, we're talking about war here. I don't know if this is the proper place for it. Yeah. But if, whatever. <laughs> if the world doesn't continue to exist and uh, put forth the uh, survival of the college at all, then you're not going to have an opportunity to study anything, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and they're they're basically just ignoring him anyways, which is like, yeah, you should probably do that. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and then Stregobor is just being super racist um, towards the elves in this in this meeting, yeah, um, basically yeah. saying like, we always knew that they were evil. Uh, they're proving it now, allying with Nilfgaard. And it was like, that was really that's really rough dude like you uh, okay sure um, yeah he totally had like an okay boomer moment in fact this is kind of this whole episode every time he shows up is kind of an okay boomer moment for him yeah and i mean it's just <laughs> it's like, like we already didn't dude. like him we dislike him even more now probably right, right. um 
I really hope you dislike him at least. Um, so basically he, he finishes up a line of like, you know, we'll be burying more than 14 mages. And then Yennefer shows up. She's like 13. Cause I'm here. I'm not dead. Ha. Um, what up? What up? And they're yeah, like, that's exactly how she entered by the right, way. Right. Yeah. And then there was they like, were like hip hop beat. Was- and she was like, you know, you know, kind of doing the whole like lean walk thing. And then she did a rap performance, and everyone was really confused, even me. Um, but yeah. no, no, it was not a weird really. choice just, for the director, but you know, it worked. It, it kind of worked. She, um, she like really committed to it, which I think made it work. Mm-hmm. So uh, everyone yeah, who's anybody who's listening to this episode without actually having watched the episode yet is probably like, "What the hell?" If, if you're watching, I mean, yes, we should have started this this episode. Um, I, I don't feel like we need to sp- explicitly say spoiler alert right, but maybe you should have watched intro. the episode before listening yeah, to this. yeah so we're recapping the episode <laughs> in, and then we're going to talk about it in more detail so right, if you haven't right. watched it you probably shouldn't be listening to this yet right and if we so bold know. face lie about something that happened it's because it's a joke and so don't take yeah, us seriously yeah. so anyway so she shows back up yeah she shows back up we cut to her and to say having a talk um and uh, to say is basically saying of how like grateful she is for universe sacrifice, but uh, you know, you're kind of uh, not looking like the best person right now. So we should probably just let Vilgefortz be the hero of Sodden and let everyone believe that he's the hero. Cause that would just be easier. Yeah. Um, and I, I totally get this here because she's going, okay, I need to play politics on this and tread carefully and I know how you are, Yen. You're like straight to the point. You don't you don't give a rat's ass how people perceive you. You're just going to say and do what you want. But I need you to just chill out right now. Let me also be, let me be the, the politician here. Yeah. Also, the northern kingdoms are uh, the elves are kind of looking like they're against the northern kingdoms right now. And you're part elf. And there's some really racist members of the council. So you should probably like lay low there. Yeah. The boomers um, are not going to be nice to you. So, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Uh, basically, Unifer is not really happy about this, but I guess she kind of agrees uh, to go along. Then we see Unifer kind of trying to heat up bath. Um but she has no magic, so she can't. Um, and then her, some of her old friends show up. We see Triss, uh, and Sabrina. Um, I'm not entirely sure who the third person is, but she doesn't really matter anyways. Um, <laughs> pretty sure she says nothing. I think, I think she yeah. has no dialogue. Yeah. She's so. kind of just like the other, the other old friend mage who just kind of fills out the room to make it feel like there's more than just three of them. That yeah, was the feeling so, I got was like, it's a group rather than just two or three. So, yeah. 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 So they, uh, it, there's, it seems like there's some like weird tension between Yennefer and Sabrina, but they just have that kind of dynamic where they're antagonistic towards each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kind of like us, Tom. Um, <laughs> but then it, it melts away. Then they, then they do the whole like, okay, but it's good to see you. Okay. It's fair. We We're don't cool. melt away. We're just always antagonists. Yeah. That's why you have so many other, weapons so. like in the pre-show. Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, <laughs> basically they have a little bit of kind of like a bonding moment. Nothing really important. Except that we see that Triss is a little uh, having some insecurity issues as far as her scar goes. She doesn't want to go get in the bath or the, the pool or whatever with everyone else because mm-hmm you know she's trying to hide the scar yeah um Um, side side point here um for modern viewers of this it a bunch of women taking off their clothing and getting in a bath together comes across kind of i don't know scantilizing kind of sexual in a way right this idea of like oh look at all these attractive ladies taking off the clothing getting in a bath together mm, why am i i don't know why i'm all of a sudden stewie from uh family guy but um the idea of public baths historically is actually a very common thing this would have been a way to relax with your friends in a world where nudity wasn't seen wasn't overly sexualized the way it is in today's society so in that kind of society it may have been something that was much more common and wouldn't to our eyes be seen in a overtly sexual kind of way so where is this scene to us the the whole like low draped dress overly comfortable clothing 
women, you know, swimming together in a pool without any clothing on comes across kind of like almost unnecessary in a way it in that society. It, that might have been just something that people did to relax and and clean themselves. And, you know, they're just like, that's what people did. There were public baths. This was like common. That's just like, that's just kind of the predilections of, uh, there you go. There's a word um, of conservative America. Oh yeah. Totally. For the most part. Cause they still totally. do stuff like this in like Japan Absolutely. and whatnot. Communal baths and stuff are still common, but America is just very conservative. So the idea of it is like, Oh no, you can't do that. You can't bathe with other people. Um, and right. So, so that's just a societal thing for the most part. Right. I didn't really, I didn't even like look at it and they don't even show like any of the nudity for it. So it's right. also maybe they were trying to kind of, I guess, help with that idea of like, it's not sexual. They're literally just bathing people. <laughs> right. So. And, and this is something that I, I believe happens in the books, but it definitely happens in the games because there's a there's a point in The Witcher 3 where Siri ends up at a public bath and where she's the point where she's healing and she's with mm -hmm. that family. Um, and it's it's all, again, part of the society. This is just something that happens in that society. And it's not supposed to be seen in a sexual way. It's a very common. It's It's supposed to be seen in a comfortable, friendly kind of comfort you know comforting kind of way and that's the that's the scene we have here is old friends getting back together in a comfortable situation letting their guard down that's what this is actually representing which i thought was interesting so push bass uh, we come to it, we're still in the bath area the next scene um it's just yennefer and tris uh and tris is kind of uh just talking to us about her feelings during the battle and how she like kind of thought she was going to die. And you know, she remembered Yennefer just walking past her. And she, in that apparently in that moment, she felt joy that of the two of them that would live, it would be Yennefer. So we see Tris has some like, kind of has some like, I guess, like I said before, maybe like insecurity issues or just like self-confidence issues um, because she doesn't seem entirely too happy with herself. And now she's struggling with it more because she got like the big old scar. Um, so just a little bit of a kind of an insight towards Tris that we'll, we'll see more of it later on in the season. Right. And, um, and this is a moment of not only like physical closeness, but also emotional closeness and opening up. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that this is a point where she would be opening up about that. So Yennefer kind of goes uh, snooping around, essentially. Um, she has a bit of a run in with Vilgefortz that's just really awkward. Um, and then she finds her way into the dungeon where she meets Kair and kind of has a conversation with him about uh, basically it, it leads to her being <laughs> having even more issues with her lack of power now because mm -hmm. he like he hits her with a line at the end of like fragile used to envy you then <laughs> yeah she doesn't anymore it was like damn okay <laughs> yeah he's he kind of reads into some things in this moment that really you know hits her yeah and and he's also he's obviously been in the cell and being and has been submitted to to say his method of trying to get his memories a little bit too much because he's obviously struggling um with his sanity because he's he's very like eccentric mm -hmm. at this is it, there's a word for you too i'm just gonna start pointing them out yeah yeah these, <laughs> um, are, these are this is advanced uh vocabulary episode <laughs> oh yeah advanced vocabulary but yeah so she <laughs> she kind of uh storms off out of there runs into stregobor stregobor is like uh, you know he's like ah oh, the elf woman that i don't like because i'm racist um i'm gonna question you um and and I hate to say this, but it's like he's obviously being way too condemning of her, mostly because she's part elf. He always has been. He's never, you know, had any like qualms about that part. But I can kind of understand his concern about, you know, 
what happened because she was gone for a while. They thought she was dead. Then she kind of showed up and it was like, it is a little weird. It's a little strange. Uh, so he kind of goes and uses to say his method of trying to grab her memories. Uh, and he gets through a good chunk of them before to say shows up, kind of blasts him into the wall yeah. and comes to Jennifer's rescue and tells him that he will, uh, he will face consequences for his actions. Um, to which the next part of that is the kind of him addressing the council. Uh, they're basically trying to, you know, tell them that he's using methods against other mages that even they like they didn't support. Um, and Stregamore manages to completely turn it around um, and tell, you know, basically get the council on his side and questioning Yennefer's loyalties, which the decision for that is that in order to prove herself, she has to kill Kair just to straight execute him. Right. Um, right. He's so he's so odious. Word of the week from Turing House. I just looked this up. Odious. It means extremely unpleasant and repulsive. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's obviously very good at manipulating his other members of the council because he, man he, he knows exactly what to say. He doesn't struggle with it at all before they're on his side. Um, so we, we move to Yennefer and Taseya having uh, another talk together. Same location as before. It's, a, it's nighttime now. Um, to say is telling her about what their council is going to require her to do in order to prove herself. Um, and she gives her the other option is that you could tell them the truth that you lost your magic. And it's like, what? How'd you know that? I didn't tell you that information. <laughs> right. Tasaya's just good. Okay. She's just that good. Yeah. She's kind of pieced it together by that point. Yeah. Um, and so we get this very kind of heart wrenching scene between the two where Jennifer is obviously struggling because she feels like she has nothing anymore because when, uh, when she first got here and she figured out all she wanted was power and status, uh, and then she lost said status. Um, but then she got love, but then she lost the love uh, oh, also, in order to gain the power and status, she lost her ability to have children, and then she lost the power. So she she doesn't have anything at this point. She's kind of at her her lowest low, and is struggling a lot with that. And to say it, kind of we through her words here and her like kind of her emotional opening up um, is proving just how much she actually cares about Yennefer because she's like saying that like Yennefer's pain causes her pain and it's like uh, damn like it, it's it's a real big kind of development from what we've seen before like we know that she cared about her but we didn't know to this extent like she basically loves her like a daughter right. kind of at this point right um so it's just a really like heart-wrenching scene between the two of them um and then later, Yennefer's trying to escape, run away from Artuza. Uh, she runs into Istrid, who tells her, you know, you can't go anywhere. Stregobor has spies. If you try to run, he's going to know, and he's going to stop you before you get too far. Um, but if you come with me, I'm going to go to Sintra uh, <laughs> with the elves, because I'm not a traitor. I just want to study the model. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> right. Dude, Right. You you really have a one track mind here, and I need you to stop. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but to his to his credit, the monoliths end up being very important later on. Yeah, that's true. But like, it's also like, dude. Yeah. But at the same time, like maybe there's something a little more important right now to be thinking about. But sure. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Yennefer has never really been uh, too attached to any of his ideas of going off together and mm -hmm. she still isn't she doesn't care um not really uh so dude leaves she stays uh and the next thing we see is them uh making their kind of trek to the memorial of the battle of sodden um where she's set to execute kair um uh, we kind of see a little bit between uh the king's um yeah the king of redania and then Foltis, the king of tamaria yeah and and, um, and the other ones too like almost all of the northern kings are there 
uh, in Queens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and they're all dressed to the nines. In fact, I would say that they all have like, you know, these very, you know, they have the crowns on. They all have royal garb. I would say some of them are even draped in like these long robes that might look like they come from, you know, ancient Rome. Maybe one of them could be called a stola, which is Miriam Webster's word of the day. You're so rude. Googling words, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, the most important, the, the two most important ones in this are uh, Redania and Tamaria. Um, and they're kind of talking. Um, we get the name drop of Dijkstra. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, is very important come next episode. Um, but basically we get Dijkstra name drop saying that Yennefer is... Uh, the one to keep an eye on. Um, and then uh, fault is drops a little bit of a line about how the most, their most trusted advisors can't be trusted anymore. Yes. He's talking about their inability to trust the mage. And that is like a big thing there um, leading into future events. So uh, we get that Yennefer set to, kill Kair, get him on the block. She's holding an ax. Um, and she cuts his chains. He runs off. She cuts down some pillars of like, like these flaming beacons that fall over. So she can't be pursued, runs off, catches a horse. Kair hops onto the horse and they ride off into the not sunset because it's already nighttime. So, right. um, and this is this scene right here is one of the most, uh, discussed scenes on the internet right now about you know like oh my god they could have done that a lot better and we'll talk about that on the second half of the show so stay tuned for that um because mm -hmm. it does seem a little bit convenient there's a horse there and that they get away so easily so we'll discuss that later on i'm sure there's a lot of horses i'm sure there are fair. but I'm it sure also there's like a ton of yeah. horses well we'll talk we'll talk more about it later but that that thus ends the yennefer portion of the episode and then we move on to the elves the elves section oh. isn't as long yeah so uh we only get two scenes with the elves the first scene is that like the elves are basically just arriving in centra francesca and phil are talking francesca is kind of like a has like blind faith in this situation because she saw a vision of Ithilene who told her to come here. And so obviously she's all in on that. And Phil Evangel is kind of using his logic to part of his brain to be like, yeah, but like, uh, can we trust this? Uh, I don't know. Um, which Francesca is just kind of throwing down all of his things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's pretty much what that is. And then the later scene, um, where Francesca and Frangilla kind of talking to each other about uh kind of i guess the both their sides of the deal kind of because right. francesca wants the elves help because they know the northern kingdoms uh better than nilfgaard does and they would be the like best like guerrilla agents to have up there um and that's what she wants out of her side of the deal and francesca's like okay but like we need a home at the end of this i need a place for my people to call home where we can be safe so kind of the start of talking about the arrangement that they're going to meet for this yeah and that's pretty much it yeah um yeah. Uh, which is kind of a little bit it's not as much yet but you can kind of see a little bit of the start of their friendship because it's more than just like a bargain with the two they actually become friends right so, and this is the beginning of them kind of ironing things out yeah, yeah. so uh and that's it for the elves and we move on to Geralt and siri mm -hmm. um a lot of this is training stuff so we start with siri training um while Geralt makes some he's making his new armor um which i thought was really cool because it's like okay Geralt can actually like make the armor um which is uh, I, th I just thought it was a cool interesting fact um series kind of like being really stubborn about her training Geralt's like you know you can rest and relax it's not like you're not gonna die uh right now like and she's being really stubborn about like you know, working way past the point that she needs to be, um, which I, I respect, you know, the determination there. Yeah, um, absolutely. She's also kind of having visions about like the woods that she's not really able to process. Mm -hmm. um, Geralt's picking up on them, but she obviously doesn't want to talk about them uh, because he tries to address it. And she, she's like, Oh, what's for lunch? And then, you know, kind of runs off. Um, Geralt's, 
dealing with guilt about killing Eskul, seeing flashbacks of like good memories the two of them had together. Um, obviously trying to kind of cope with this. Uh, he's getting a lot of flack from like Lambert, especially. Yeah. Basically. Of course. Um, which it's Lambert. <laughs> it's it Lambert. Makes sense. He's gonna. Um, yeah. So it, it's, he's having to kind of deal with these, you know, emotions uh, and, and, you know, the consequences and then meanwhile, uh, Lambert, I guess he figures out that Geralt's not going to take any of his shit. And he's like, all right, well, I can still take it out on the little girl who's training outside. <laughs> so she basically dick. goes to, yeah. he, he basically goes, he's bullying Siri. Uh -huh. Siri's showing like a lot of determination in the face of him saying, mm -hmm. you know, like, I want to be, I want to do what a witcher does. Um, and Lambert's like, all right, fine. We'll show you then. And they take her out to this big old contraption. Um, basically, this is kind of like the Netflix cinematic universe of their pendulum, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's these big swinging pendulums. There's this like spinny thing with like the top two are going in one direction and the bottom and the middle one is going in opposite direction. Yeah. These and blades, they have yeah. like big spiky wooden poles on right, them that you yeah. have to dodge. There's little platforms you have to ascend along the side of the, the, the mountain. Then there's uh, I guess a seesaw, a swing thing yeah, that you like have a, to swing mm -hmm, on. And right. then you have to catch these dangling ball it's 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 like old school witcher uh, american ninja warriors right yeah absolutely of. absolutely yeah it's it's testing it's testing your agility your balance your strength um all of that stuff yeah so uh basically to take her out to that lambert's just daring her here at this point siri hops onto it for the first time gets knocked into the snow <laughs> just boom, <laughs> down yeah. yeah and then so. she's like oh and then she gets up yeah, she gets up and she goes again. And so we get to see this, this scene over kind of like multiple portions. Um, the next part, we see her get hit over and over and over and over again by these pendulums. And Lambert is telling her basically that she's not cut out for it and that she doesn't have what it takes and that she should just give up and go home. Um which is like, oof, that's pretty cruel, Lambert. But you're Lambert, so it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> right. So uh, right. Geralt, and but of course, but of course, him saying that is just making her want it more. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. She's determined. Right. So uh, Geralt and Vesemir take Eskel's body out to uh, this cave um, and kind of have like a talk, and then we get to see kind of what a Witcher Wolf School um funeral looks like which is where they just feed the body to wolves yeah which is metal it's <laughs> yeah it's metal. pretty metal yeah totally. um so then we cut back uh or, or they are coming back from the funeral uh they're kind of wondering where siri's at she's supposed to be looking after the horses right now cohen runs to the gate and he's like hey you need to see this takes him out to the contraption where siri or well where yeah, Siri's going again, and mm -hmm. Lambert is not like being an asshole anymore. He's straight coaching her through this. Right, right. So right, because she's doing she's doing well at this point, and now there's like a crowd that's gathered. Yeah, all the witches are out there watching. Yeah. It's pretty tense, and so we get to see Siri go make her final run on this thing. She's getting through all of the obstacles. And then at the very last part where she hangs from those like dangling chains, she, she jumps to the platform, falls off. Uh -huh. But like, I still count that a victory. I don't care. Like she's it been doing this. It was How so many close. times right, right. has she done this? She's tired, worn out, bruised and battered uh -huh. and she managed to make it that far even after all of that and touch the final Definitely platform with props. her feet yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, and then cares? and then she she lands on the ground and then there's the scene where where Geralt leans down and she says something like i almost made it and he says she says nothing she she's say, literally oh, right 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 he waiting says, for like i guess she wants i i don't know what she, she looks like she wants him to like i guess be nice or something and he's just like 
so close yeah 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 so close <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like that's great yeah but you didn't do it <laughs> like, yeah <it's> like, oh. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> um next part is he's patching her up obviously she's pretty messed up right now from from all that training so mm-hmm. he's patching her up um she's very upset about it you know uh she tells him that she wants to be a good fighter and he tells her I've met a lot of people in my life who wanted to be good fighters. Guess where all of them are at cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you can't just like, it's not just wanting to be a good fighter. You have to have like some other reason. And we know Geralt has his code. So like he, he has more of like a higher value, like Knights kind of honor stuff going on in his mind. Um, So, you know, being a good fighter, isn't good enough in his opinion. So she, you know, storms off again. She's still being super determined. Wants to, wants to train real hard. Uh, he notices kind of like something weird at the wall, a bunch of roots growing into it. And he yanks out her like Centrin cloak. Um, and that was basically completely encased in roots and vines. Yeah. And he's like, this is really weird. He finds her. She's training really hard in the dining hall with Cohen. And we see, that that like her forms that she was practicing before are way down like she's got them down now yeah. like she's like flowing through these forms uh like a champ so obviously her training is paying off and he Geralt comes up to her, approaches her asks her like you know you've been having these like these feelings he doesn't exactly know their visions yet Mm -hmm. but he's like you've been having these feelings if you were to follow the feeling where would it take you and she tells him the woods so they go out into the woods you know they go uh, a short distance and they come across a one-handed leshy yeah Uh, the one that Eskel fought and cut its hand off. Uh, it, mm-hmm. it, it is here. Uh, it must have followed him and, or something and is like attached to Siri for some reason. So they get into a fight. Uh, they're, this is like one of the things I think I pointed this out in the trailer analysis. Mm-hmm. The, the like synchronization that they have in this moment is just super cool to me because like she knows exactly where to move and to step for him to have like the freedom of movement that he needs to defend the two of them yeah which is just super cool to watch that like to see like where her train one her training is paid off Mm -hmm. so i've been training hard and two i guess just that bond that they have together where they know how to you know like to that point where they know how to like move they move and read each other yeah 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 yeah. so i just thought that that part was cool um and it's really cool whenever uh this giant freaky bug thing shows up and just cuts the leshy in half and it's like what wait yeah yeah and we what? talked about this a little bit on the on the patron episode how like another leshy fight would have been would have felt redundant by this point and mm-hmm. how having having this shortcutted by another different monster that Geralt doesn't expect and then has to deal with, it actually turned out to be, in my mind, more interesting. So Geralt tells her GTFO um, because he wasn't expecting this and he's not prepared to fight this thing. Um, we assume you would assume he would have prepared to fight the Leshy right. before because he kind of knew that's what they were going after. Now he's like, okay, this is a new monster. I've also never seen before, right. by the way, right. Uh, yeah. Don't what, know what this is. What do I do here? So she runs, uh, he gets like knocked into a tree or something. Um, and it runs after her. She's running away. Uh, beautiful area, by the way, like this, the scenic area here is just awesome and amazing. Yeah. Um, she gets, she starts climbing over rocks to like, kind of get away from it. It shows up at the top of the rocks. You're like, aha, I cut you off. And she's like, well, crap, I got to go the other way. Now she's on these rocks and it's not exactly the easiest to move. She's moving on difficult terrain for those D and D players out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. She, she gets a minus, she gets, uh, whatever she, she has to have her movement speed. Movement. It's not great. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So this thing catches up to her and it's like, it corners her, but it like, it hesitates for a really long time for like a monster that probably doesn't have that high of like a, th- thinking function like it 
it's not like yeah. super well, sentient by any means i mean i'm assuming not but then you also look closely it at be. it and it looks it looks very uh insect like but then when you look closer it almost has like human like smaller arms well it's like well, like the head of it that? is like a freaky skull looking thing too. right like it's like it, it has almost human like quality so you have to wonder is this like and they were talking about these kinds of creatures being mutants of some sort like is this something that was actually mutated between some sort of human and bug kind of hybrid thing? So maybe it does actually have some higher thinking ability. Oh God, like, FEV in Witcher. That's yeah, spooky. because I mean, it does it does uh, seem to have some human parts in it, which right. also really kind of creeped me out once I noticed that when we got I think a better it look at it. All kinds of creepy. What do you yeah. get a close up on it? It's mm -hmm. like, oh God, this thing is terrifying. But yeah. uh so we're not sure what exactly he's trying to do, but we could assume, you know, it's trying to kill her. It's got her cornered. Uh and then Geralt leaps over the edge of the rocks above uh and just straight cuts it in half. Uh, or yeah. no no it, cu it, it cuts comes down, down the, right. the back and then uh, cuts off like uh, one of its like arms and then gets a decapitation on it because right. its head goes flying into the screen. Yeah, um, yeah. I went in doubt. Cut, cut a thing's head off. That's usually a good start to try and yeah. kill a thing. So yeah. he, he knows at least that much is a good attempt at killing a thing. So it worked. Yep. And uh, that's that's. <laughs> It's like the end of the Carol series. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's where it ends. Um, uh, and for anybody who doesn't know, FEV is a reference to Fallout. That's the virus that uh, mutates a lot of the creatures in the Fallout world to turn them into abominations and super mutants and things like that. So, uh, it, and if you want to know more about it, you should go listen to the Fallout lore cast. There you yeah, go. I'm plugging your other yeah. show, Tom, yeah. your most popular oh. show that I don't need to plug, but I'm doing it anyway. And and for those of you who are into these TV shows but don't necessarily play the games, they're they're working. Uh, th this year that there was an announcement about a year ago that they're working on a fallout TV show um, but they are now this year moving into starting filming and and actually officially getting into the, the nitty-gritty of making the show so maybe by this time next year we'll have a release date for the fallout TV show which should be super cool I would hope and That'd so be cool yeah that, that you know if you're if you're not a gamer but you're a TV show watcher then that might be something worth checking out in a year from now. Um, but that's uh, that's the recap. Let's move on and thank our patrons. And we'll be back with a little bit more of a closer look at the episode when we get back. Very well. Let us get this over with. Something has infested my vineyard. Mm -hmm. Great. Let me go prepare my something oil then. All right. Here we are in the middle of the show where we get to thank our patrons and no new patrons this week. We have our regular group of 11 patrons and thank you to everybody, all 11 of you for helping to support the show. We really do appreciate it. You guys help to make this a regular thing that Toasty and I can prioritize and make a part of our regular schedule. It helps make this a full time job for me, along with all the rest of the podcasts and running the network. It helps make this a, a legitimate side project priority for Toasty. And we really do appreciate it. Also, it is the 17th right now. We record these live on Monday nights on Twitch and on YouTube and on Facebook. Anywhere you look up Robots Radio on any of those locations, any of those websites, you can watch us live on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. 7 6 6 p.m. Pacific. I feel like all of a sudden my brain was like, what's the time difference? Um, seven mountain time, seven <laughs> mountain time. There you go. Uh, but if you want to join us live, you're always welcome to do that. We love seeing the comments from those of you who are currently live and we can't always respond to them right away. But thank you so much for the comments. Uh, we love seeing them. But if you would like to join us at the end of this month for the patron episode, we currently have four Leshen level patrons who are going to be able to join us. So this is coming up in two weeks on the 31st. It's the last Monday of the month. So you still have two weeks left to sign up or to upgrade to join us on that episode. And there are a bunch of other tiers that you can join up for, even if you just want to get ad free episodes or a bunch of other stuff. So go check out patreon.com if we've helped, uh, you know, with your commutes or your workouts or your drives to work or your wife deciding to go buy the neighbor's grill and have to go to the store to get a bunch of charcoal and then figure out how to use it so that we could cook uh, hamburgers today because maybe you did that too and you could go to patreon.com slash witcher lorecast while you listen to podcasts and that happened 
because you appreciate us. It could have happened. Mm, maybe it could have. Yeah, it could have. Could have. It could have. Also, uh, another way that you we'd love for you to help us out is leaving a rating or review. We don't have any new ratings or reviews on Apple Podcasts, but if you happen to listen on Apple Podcasts or just happen to have an Apple account, you can just look us up on Apple Podcasts and leave a rating or review there. If you leave some words in a five star review, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. And if you listen on Spotify, then they now have a way to rate podcasts as well. Go to where you can specifically choose the podcast, but not the episodes. Scroll to the top, look underneath the name and the description. And on the top left, you'll see a little section where you can rate the number of stars. Give us a little five star review. It really does help make sure that Spotify knows that, Hey, we're a good show and we should be recommended for other people to, to check out. It really does help. We, we appreciate all of, all of the ones we've gotten so far. We have 105 Spotify ratings. That is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, And we're sitting at a 4.9. That's awesome. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time to do that. I know uh, almost 50% of our listeners listen on Spotify and we've got like 60 plus percent, I think, actually 60 plus. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a large percentage a of our lot. audience. And if half of our listeners on Spotify went and did this right now, we would have several thousand to five star reviews. So just oh, to yeah. just to give you a, a sense of the size of our audience. Thank you. We really appreciate it. There are a lot of you guys out there listening to the podcast and there are a lot of you listening on Spotify. If we could even hit, you know, 200 five star reviews, that would be amazing. So if, if you happen to be listening right now and you can just take the time to go drop us a review or a rating on Spotify, that would be amazing. Um, if we hit 500, Toasty will dye his hair. No, that's not okay. true. Oh, I mean, he's down with it. Okay, but I mean, that was the that was the patron goal of hitting $250 on Patreon. But if we hit 500, uh, whichever hits first. 500 five star reviews on Spotify or $250 on Patreon, whichever one hits first, Toasty will dye his hair white and he will he will look like Geralt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds awesome. That's that's great. Yes. All right. That's that's the deal. Well, again, thank you to all of our patrons and everyone who takes the time to help support the show or even just tell your friends. We really do appreciate it. All right, let's move on with the rest of the show. You smell of death and destiny, heroics and heartbreak. It's on you now. Right, yeah. All right, Toasty, we're back to the rest of the podcast. What did you think about this episode? Do you have any... um, any any specific points that you want to discuss? Well, there was one thing. So I didn't mention this mm-hmm. in the recap, but I did want to mention it. Okay, it, it, it kind of it didn't really have like any of our main characters in it. It was a it was kind of a smaller scene. So we get this scene of Stregobor teaching a class at Bernard. Um, and he's kind of teaching a history lesson about Falka. Um, and basically she's like this elven uh, rogue who was, who set about to kill a bunch of like monarchs. <laughs> uh-huh. um, at least that's how he's presenting it. Um, and so it's just more, it's more Stregobor, bigotry you know so boomer. okay um, boomer does that yeah. one count is that a good word bigotry um, <clears throat> yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I'll find we'll another see. another uh, word of the day uh-huh. let's find but, another uh, one dictionary.com's word of today is altruistic which is not what he was being fair enough um so easter shows up he's like kind of poked his head into the class he shows up um and he's kind of refuting these claims saying that like falco was the one that was wronged and she was just kind of like getting justice for the things that were done to her Mm -hmm. um yeah i would i would say that uh istrid's ability to understand other people's perspective is is much more malleable which is the new york times word of the day than stragopor's Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know why we're doing <laughs> this is an interesting bit for the episode, but anyways, so, uh, and this is like this, like Stregobor 
this is something that I noticed here. So I'm not exactly an expert as far as like English and debate goes, but Stregobor jumps into this argument with fallacy after fallacy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So he basically talks about this and then he says, uh, he says, everyone knew that Falco was quarter elf, just like Yennefer. One, when the fuck was Yennefer mentioned in this conversation? <laughs> like, right. Why? What? You, I'm frozen. Free- yeah, yeah froze. I, I'm going to unfreeze in a second. But yes. Okay, cool. But so basically he just starts targeting an individual that has nothing to do with this. And he's relating things. So basically because Falka was a bad person and she was quarter elf, that means because Yennefer is quarter elf, she's also a bad person. Um, Tom broke. Oh, there he is. We're cool. <laughs> I'm back. Um, I believe that's a post hoax fallacy, right? Like... Yeah, then it's um, it might be. I, I don't remember yeah. specifically which fallacy it is, but I, I yes, I, but it's it's like just said, it's bad. Expert, it is definitely like, a fallacy. So for anybody who doesn't know, logical fallacies are often used to argue points um, in ways that manipulate other people into believing that these are actually good, solid, logical points, but they actually aren't. They fall apart upon closer inspection. The problem with this is that a lot of times people are fooled by logical fallacies. You'll find logical fallacies used oftentimes by people who, one, either don't realize that they aren't logically sound or two, are used by people who do realize that they are logically sound, but do it anyway or not logically sound, but do it anyway because the audience that they're using it in front of or or to, they think they can get away with it. So Mm. politicians do this all the time. This is one of the reasons why it's important to study logic and reasoning, because you can start noticing these trends. So, for example, a a common one is um, the straw man fallacy. So let's say Toasty says, I don't like this episode because of X, Y and Z. And I say, well, that's fine. I think the episode's good and your opinion doesn't count anyway because you're ugly. That's a straw man, right? Like, it doesn't Unlimited. matter how ugly Toti is because that shouldn't affect his the his argument about the episode. Those two things are not related. I'm not mm-hmm. countering his argument. I'm just countering him with a, a personal attack. That's yeah. a that's a straw man argument. Right. But you'll hear th- Which, these kinds of things happen all the time. Which Stregobor implements immediately after mm-hmm. this. I'm pretty sure it's the post hook. I'm just going to keep saying it. Somebody uh-huh. can yell at me in a, I, uh, an Apple review if they want. I don't care. Um, <laughs> sure. Discord. Don't sure. Care. Uh, but basically, he does that. Istrid calls him on his BS and he's like, oh, so you're saying Yennefer's evil now, too. And uh, or no, no, he's saying, oh, you're saying that they're related now. Um or something like right. you, you, right. you're trying to say that they're related. Right. You're, you've got some weird conclusions going on. And then he attacks Istrid and in saying that a historian should know bloodlines better. Right. <laughs> and it's like, just because they both happen to be elves doesn't mean they're relate. Like you're, 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 you're assuming a connection and then criticizing him for not coming to the same conclusion about an assumed connection like there yeah there are just logical fallacies compounding on top of logical fallacies he has a very uh impressionable audience in front of him so they're just straight up eating up whatever the hell stregobor says absolutely there's at no point absolutely history even stood a chance right right um yeah and uh, and 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 you'll, you'll find that that in just in many circles in our own world and in in fictional worlds the people who are swayed by logical fallacies tend to be people who are less educated they tend to people or people who are more desperate, people who are more uh, afraid, people who are in more dire circumstances, because it's not the, they're not taking a critical look at the argument. They're looking at the thing being promised by the person mm-hmm. and, and and they don't care about the argument so much as the the hope for the thing that getting what they want. And the fact that that person seems like a strong leader because they just shut the other person down, but they didn't 
actually shut the other person down. They just threw a bunch of words together that don't actually mean anything in a very rude manner. <laughs> and like yeah. these kinds of things happen all the time. And Stregobor just did this very thing in this situation, which and it worked out for him. But he, right. it's not enough for him. Right. Uh, he really has to drive it home. So he shows uh, the fact that uh, because of Falca, he lost his hands. Right. He got no hands. Now, in that which, scene, did, did was that a so there's two ways of reading that situation one he still doesn't have hands and his current his actual his hands are constantly an illusion or he lost his hands at some point and so he was using an illusion to show what it looked like when he lost his hands but has since grown back hands through the use of magic and and whatever and so now he still actually has hands again but at some point in the past he didn't which one do you think it is that one's like a really (sighs) because it seems later on in other episodes like he actually has physical hands like he's he's touching things he's doing things it seems at first i thought oh he just doesn't have hands and he's constantly you know constantly conjuring an illusion to make him look self self look normal but as the season went on i i flipped and i thought okay he was showing an illusion of what it looked like when he lost his hands but at some point he grew them back or magic back actual physical see i'm also there's also like a third thing to me which i kind of believe the third thing more is that he's full of shit and never lost his hands right and made it up and cast an illusion to make it make it look so tragic like oh this is this what i'm sure like uh that's like that's the equivalent of like casting like the minor illusion cantrip in D. like that's probably nothing for him to just be like yo look at these messed up hands these are totally right. what my hands right. look like yeah in the real like, story is that like he stubbed his thumb or something and, and knowing yeah. him he's like always looking for pity like even back in like the first episode of season one he's always looking for pity so it's like he would totally do something like that like uh, he's he's shady as fuck he would he would go to the extent to do that yeah. so yeah constantly manipulating other people yeah it, it's hard to tell i kind of believe that like he did he's never lost his hands and he was just pulling pulling strings a bit more because yeah. t-rex in chat says he also puts them in yennefer's head when he does the memory thing so there is that yeah yeah so, so uh, i tend probably, to th- whatever is that going on he seems like he has he's a physical definitely got hands something there yeah yeah so um who knows uh maybe we'll find out eventually who knows Mm -hmm. so uh that was pretty much it that i wanted to talk about that that scene with um between the two uh and next uh tom we we got the mutated monsters now coming back in right so yeah uh, nightmare of the wolf kind of introduced the idea of mutated monsters um and now we're seeing that come back around right now this isn't a book thing this is a witcher cinematic universe thing Mm -hmm. this is this is a um a new concept so people who tend to you know people who are book we'll call them book sticklers are are going to say well this wasn't necessary they didn't need to do it but people who are going well let's let's take a moment and just see what they're doing here let's let's give them a fair shake and say okay why did they introduce mutant monsters what is the point of this i feel like my my thought on it is to have something new that people haven't really seen before because obviously there's a big chunk of audience um that hasn't interacted with anything witcher and are watching the show and that's their first introduction to anything witcher at all Mm -hmm. to which case mutated or not the monsters don't actually like matter to them like it's like okay they're monsters like that it's not going to be a big deal to those people but to the people so probably what i would assume is the good chunk of people that have played the games um like especially like the witcher 3 who probably came over to watch the show because they played the game and loved that game. You've kind of seen all the monsters right in the Witcher three. Like you fight multiple versions of like every monster right in that game. So if they were to show like just those things over again, it's something we've already seen. Mm-hmm. That's really my own. That's like, 
my thought on that is what I feel like yeah. maybe that's why they went with the mutated route. Yeah, I think that could be part of it. I also think that there's a connection to the mutated monsters and the big bad. I think that we're going to find that there's some there's more intentionality between the mutated monsters and the wild hunt. And we're, we're this series is going to go further into revelations about the wild hunt and the individuals in the wild hunt and mm-hmm. some of the things that they've been doing. Um, we're not just going to have, I mean, for most of the books and even most of the games well into the Witcher three, the wild hunt is just this myth. They're just like, you don't really learn that much about them. You actually learn a decent chunk in the books. So to be in, so at what point, at what point in the books fairly new, but for the books, we get to see the perspective of Siri meeting the wild hunt before they're even technically called the wild hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, so like it, it's, it's part of her whole like space time thing where she basically teleports into a different dimension and is being like taken in by elves because she's like this kind of mythical thing to them. Um, and they're trying to trap her and like hold her for her power. Right. Um, right. Which and, seems uh, connected to this, this season yeah. later on. But do you think that yeah. there's more that we're just going to like in Ben of Tamara says just one of them. I think uh, one of the things that uh, what's her face, the showrunner said is that each of the, I believe she said something like each of the seasons, we're going to get more of a glimpse of, of different members of the wild hunt. Okay. So, so I think, like kind of like the Witcher three, where you like fight one every so often. Mm hmm. And yeah. Even though it's just a fight, you're not really learning a whole lot about them. But here, but I think we might get character development, right? Like we learn, we te- we 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 learned more this season about, um, about the witch. The um, what's her face? Uh, to say it? No, or no. The deathless mother. The deathless mother. Like right. we we got a sense of like what she's about, what she's what she feeds off of, what she really is is wanting, um. And I, I think the mutated monsters are going to tie into some of that because clearly they were the mutated monsters were after Siri. Mm-hmm. There's a connection there. There's yeah. like the, that's that's going to come back and that's going to come back some more and some more. There's probably someone in the wild hunt that these are specifically connected to. And th- that's going to be revealed more over time. So that's my theory. And it was a way to create that foreshadowing in connection early enough in the in the show for it to actually bear fruit later maybe even seasons later and to continue growing so not only like to your right we're going to get monsters we've never seen before or variations on monsters we've never seen before uh, what feels like a bigger new threat to Geralt things that he has never had to, to fought, deal with in, in, a, in a fight because even after season one we get this the sense of like yeah, he's been around he's kind of fought everything He's he's the golden boy of the witchers, you know, like, but it, like even then it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole season has demonstrated that Geralt's too OP and that he's an anime <laughs> protagonist. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, he's he's the main character. We're going to get that. But we also then have this season where like these monsters do show up and then they 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 kick some witcher butt sometimes. And like that, he's happens. not Geralt. He's just he not just Geralt. murders. He murders all of them in one hit. Mm, right much, yeah that does so, happen so you know, you know but yeah it's just it's welcome to tv shows and movies you know or the, the the hero gets hurt tragically and then ends up getting over it after an episode or two you know like uh, plot armor Fair enough. like Fair plot enough. armor is a thing like it wouldn't be called the witcher if the witcher died in the third episode right like mm-hmm. that's just how it's gonna go so i i think that that's a big part of it um i don't know that's as far as i've got with that i think that they're there for later reveals mm-hmm. so uh kind of the next thing was just like it's it's weird to think that this was kind of like a fairly actiony episode we get a lot of like siri training mm-hmm. obviously we get the whole thing with like the pendulum uh and then we get like you know monster fights as well um, which kind of, it's, it's kind of like throws me off a little bit because it's like, that's a lot that happened. Plus of just like all of the other things that happened. It was in dense. The episode. It was this a dense is, episode. This is a dense episode. Yeah. Um, 
So it's kind of, can you stop clicking things on the, on the dock? Yes. Yeah. ADHD does not like that. Well, actually it does like that, but me focusing <laughs> is not going to like it. Tom's a child to all the <laughs> listeners. He's just a child. So um, yeah. So it was a very dense episode. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then I mentioned it in the summary. Uh, I hadn't wrote it down, but I mentioned it. Um, but just that point of the fact that uh, it seems like the kings of the northern kingdoms are starting to distrust their mages. Um, you know, and for people familiar um, with The Witcher, uh, you might see where that's going. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting to see how that plays out. And the introduction of the name Dijkstra. Mm-hmm. I think those two and things I'm sure coincide. didn't help this situation when she let the prisoner go and ran off. I mean, that doesn't help with, you know, oh, we don't trust the mages. Oh, this one just straight up betrayed us. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, although, to be fair, they seemed amused. I, like, I think you see their reaction afterwards or maybe just falses, but they don't seem like upset. They seem amused, which I thought was interesting. Maybe because, um, I don't know, confirmation bias. Like, they were yeah. like, oh, I was thinking this thought. Oh, thank you for demonstrating why I should be thinking this thought. You made me feel better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting because they do seem like amused by the whole thing rather than outraged, which is what you would probably assume to be the reaction. Or expect to be the reaction? Yeah. 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 It's so okay, so let's let's talk about the Yen escaping scene. Okay. Because so the criticism from the internet is she cuts the chain. First of all, giant axe, one swing, cuts a chain like that. That doesn't it's that's not it's not that easy, guys. Chains like that are very hard to cut. Even with a big axe, it's not that easy. Two, grabs, like, knocks over some piles in front of a bunch of mages and armed guards and then just gets away? Like, none of the mages could have just cast a spell and stopped her from running? And she has no magic ability. To. It, I mean, th- it, there's got to be an explanation like that. There's got to be a like, I mean, in the scene, they all look like, oh, no, we're, what's I mean, going uh, on? One, one explanation is that uh, for, for at least I have I have something to explain the chain cutting. OK, so let me let me go through all sense. the conveniences of this, because this yeah. this whole scene just smells like cheesy TV convenient, like setup where they just could have taken more time to like they could have had a situation where this happens and they get away and written it better but it just seems like a a way too easy convenient situation she she you know she's given the opportunity um thank you denton for the for the donation um she's given the opportunity to to chop his head off she decides not to she cuts the chain right First of all, it all could right, have, so let's start with that. Let's start, let's start with, with that. that. It could right. have been so, ropes. Let, let me just let me just lay them all out because I, I I don't want to forget them all. So so cuts the chain, right? Knocks over a bunch of stuff where they could have like why is that keeping them from getting to her? Grabs him and jumps over a low wall. <laughs> there happens to be a horse. No other horses. Nowhere nowhere to tie up a horse. Whose horse even is that? No other guards posted in that part of the place has a quick little conversation with him hops on the horse rides away and gets away <laughs> two people on a horse get away the, the the weight of two individuals on a horse when there are a bunch of armed people and mages who could teleport in front of her <laughs> right so the situation is either super cheesy and just like tv convenient or there's something going on where it was just like somebody was just like helping her or they were just okay with her leaving okay so so i'm gonna start with the chains right we've already seen the fact that not all like metal ain't shit in this universe okay <laughs> it seems like it the yeah. first episode yeah. of season one we saw people literally poking swords through chest plates all right metal mm. has not had very consistent like uh, um 
physical physics values as far as like this universe goes. Okay. Right. right. Just doesn't work. So whatever, like they've never had the consistency there. Sure. You okay. So let's move past that. Now. That's, that's not, that's good. not the biggest problem, but okay. So, this, so even, even if she has the ability to cut the chain, she cuts the chain, right? She knocks over some pyres. Mm-hmm. And then I think nobody reacts in tires. time. Every, no one reacts. I think it's a bit of surprise, I guess. I, I don't think one, I think the, the, probably the rest of the council is surprised. Stregobor probably not surprised, probably expected it. He's probably okay with letting her go because it just proves his point. Right. To is not surprised at all. We see it on her face. She is not surprised by this. And I'm pretty sure all those conveniences at the end of, you know, the one horse and not being guarded in that area to say I made that happen. So that could be that could be true. I bet she made that because she there it would have no been nice there. It would have been nice happy. if that was the case, if they clued us into that, if they hung a candle on it and later on had a quick little conversation either at the end of this episode or at the beginning of another episode where someone says, why? How did she get away? And we have a moment where Taseya says something like, you know, like in con- in confidence to, I don't know, one of her close comrades or something says something like, Vilgefortz? Yeah, Vilgefortz. <laughs> or like, Vilgefortz, like, how did that happen? How, you know, like, why, why did she get her? Or, or I still, I still disagree with letting, letting Yennefer get away so easily. Something like that to just like clue us into the fact that like they let her get away. Right. But. They didn't. They didn't do that. Um, the other thing is they could have totally made this work by just inventing some sort of like single use magic portal. Like somewhere in the well, she was in the dungeon rummaging through just all the magic stuff. And she happened to like because she can't cast spells, but she came across like a single use like little object that's like a portable portal. And you break it, it opens up a portal, and you can get in it, and you disappear someone ra- somewhere randomly. You know, it's not even a very good one or something. And she just grabs him, she drops the portal, they just jump in it, they disappear, the thing disappears, and now they just don't know where where she went. Like that could have been fine, you know. And then that that would have explained the whole like, oh well, they they got away. How did she get away? Well, she she dropped a she dropped a portable portal. Well, that sucks because now we can't track her. Because nobody knows where, because those things are random. She could have ended up anywhere. You know? Okay. And she was desperate enough to use it. Who would use a portable portal? Those things are, like, nobody uses those. Those things are dangerous. Well, she, you know, like, that would have been a better explanation. I don't know. I, I it, like, they, they didn't, they didn't hang, hang a candle on it, and they didn't come up with a better explanation. And that, that to me, feels lazy. It's not the end of the world, but... Again, going back to some of the things I said last week, it seems like there could have just been like, had they just had a little bit more time or just a little bit more carefulness in the writing, like they could have just written that scene a little bit better, you know, okay. like they, they could have, they could have had a scene where, where to looks and nods at, you know, somebody else and just kind of gives them a, like a, yep, I knew she was going to do it. Let her go. something but yeah it's uh t-rex says uh yeah i want to say the kings were talking about how magic is blocked yeah i think there there was some some sense of how magic was blocked but even if they like got outside of the circle you know like even if there was like uh they go running for it and then some guards come up after them and they get outside of the magic block zone circle and then she drops the magic item and then they go through the portal and they disappear like they could have written it like that right Oh, well, they were about to get a caught magic up. Magic blocked item and that's running off on a horse is fine because. But then they like, could have got can't. caught by you know like wouldn't have you wouldn't you have sent like guards on other horses to go chase them down like wouldn't they eventually catch them? The kings weren't like they weren't upset about this though they were fine with it like the the, the, the kings wanted the kings wanted this guy kings. dead. Didn't, yeah, didn't, but like, th- but they were more satisfied with the fact that the their point was being proven with their mages being like not trustworthy anymore because yeah. yeah, like i said yeah. this happened and they were amused they weren't upset they weren't outraged they didn't stand and yell and scream yeah. they sat in their yeah. chairs and they smiled right like yeah it's, it's a it's a weird scene it's it's just the fact that it is so vague and that we can have this conversation 
means that it could have been done a little more clearly. Yeah, eh, I don't know. It just it's it, I don't know. There's just there's just vagueness around it, and people have been arguing about it, which to me is means that hey, it just could have been done better. Okay, well, you know. Uh, Internet, have your fun, argue about it. <laughs> Just make sure when you're presenting your arguments not to use logical fallacies. In them, <laughs> don't okay? use don't logical be fallacies. Don't be a stregobor. Don't be a stregobor. Yeah, don't be a stregobor. Yeah, so. And uh, the slang word of the day, according to English Club, is zip. Okay. Use, cool. Which means nothing or zero. So use don't use zip fallacies it doesn't work stop it doesn't, it doesn't um, work at all does it but yeah so i guess Crap. that's that was you know kind of uh uh going into our little pros and cons section um you know so obviously that was very much con um i i'm not gonna elaborate because we've already kind of done i just like i appreciated seeing more siri Geralt development more siri development at all like overall, as far as like training and whatnot, to say and Yin's relationship there was, I feel like a big aspect of the episode. So mm -hmm. just seeing like those characters develop. So, um, Tom, what, what would you rate this episode? Uh, let's see. I'm thinking back through everything. There's some crazy stuff that happens. We get we get some crazy stuff with Yen. We get some crazy stuff. The, the training stuff with Siri is, is the highlight of the episode. The fact that mm -hmm. she is just so determined and she gets so cla so close to making it through all, all of that. Um, and even some of the monster stuff is pretty cool. I think it's just, I mean, other than the, the weird ending and the fact that that's so just odd. Um, it's still an enjoyable episode. It's intense. There's a This is a very intense episode with the whole brain stuff and Stregobor being you know a boomer well, all of that stuff i mean it's not it's not an episode that i enjoyed a lot but i felt like it was well done up until about the the weird ending so i'm going to give it i'm going to give it an 8 i think it's, i think it gets a solid 8 i think yeah. if if they had, if they nailed the ending better then it would have been like a 9 i think uh i think i agree with the 8 it's it's I kind of, I, I was, I think at the beginning of this episode, we, I had it lower, but as we kind of talked about it and I was kind of thinking, I was like, you know, they, they actually managed to fit a lot of stuff in here and it didn't feel like it was too overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and a lot of things it, that are important for the rest of the season. Yeah. And so like, yeah, it's definitely bumped me up. Um, yeah, I don't think it. I don't think it goes into that nine to ten range as far as, especially because it's like, even though they did that, and I gave them props for like how much like they managed to put in it, it still wasn't like as enjoyable as an episode as like the first two. Um, so yeah, I think an eight's a pretty good place to put it at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your ratings on these things. And if you'd like to join us on the robots radio discord, there's, uh, there's actually two uh, Witcher channels, the Witcher spoiler channel. If you want to talk about spoilery stuff. And then of course the regular channel. And so the link is in the show notes, or you can just search robots radio discord. It's also on the website, robotsradio.net. We'd love to hear, hear your thoughts. You can always tweet at us. Um, Toasty, you got anything else you want to share before we head out? Uh, just follow us on the Witcher Lorecast on Twitter. Um, it's about everything I got right now. So, yeah, yeah, and uh, make sure that you get those uh, ratings in on Spotify so we can get Toasty to dye his hair. Yep, that too. That would be amazing. That yeah, would be so good. Yeah. That would be. Yeah, so and then, uh, man, we would get so many more people watching us on the Witcher Lorecast YouTube channel watching these episodes. If you had like dyed hair, they'd be like, "Oh my god, I have to see this." Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, um, for those of you who don't know. There is a channel dedicated. So most of most of my stuff shows up on the Robots Radio YouTube channel, but this podcast has its own YouTube channel all to itself, the Witcher Lorecast YouTube channel. And we would love if you would help us grow that channel and get us up to that thousand subscribers amount. This channel has been around for a few months. I moved uh, all the videos used to be on the Robots Radio channel along with all the other podcasts that I do, but that's too confusing for YouTube. It doesn't know what to do with that. With YouTube the has to specialize. It has to specialize. Has to specialize. Right. So I so a few months ago, I took everything, divided it all up. So 
all of these episodes now show up on the Witcher Lorecast channel. So it's kind of like starting over. So if you would do us a favor and head over to the Witcher Lorecast YouTube channel, you can just search it. It'll show right up and drop us a subscription on there. Help us get up to a thousand subs. That would be absolutely huge. That would be such such a big deal. We would really, really appreciate it. So that would be amazing. Um, also, everything that you can check out for Robots Radio is at robotsradio.net, including all the other podcasts that I do. Anything else that Twi- Toasty does in the future, if his other shows come back or if he decides to do any other shows and all the mm-hmm. other awesome shows on the network are over there. And um, I will continue to be streaming here on the Robots Radio YouTube channel or on Twitch every night during the week, except for probably Saturday nights. That's my nut off. And that'll be for other podcasts and also game streams and things like that, including playing Skyrim with my mom, which is usually on Tuesdays. So uh, lots of fun stuff coming up, including a very special episode of the Cyberpunk Lorecast tomorrow night. So if you're listening to this in time, you can join us for the episode live. So there you go. Lots of good stuff. And um, we will see you guys again next time. And Stregobor is definitely aware of the English English club's saying of the day, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. We'll see you guys next time. Stay safe on the path. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Witcher Lorecast. We'd love to hear about your experiences with the games and the books and the TV series and all your thoughts on everything. Please check out the Robots Radio Discord and follow us on Twitter at Witcher Lorecast. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.